Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. For the past few weeks, we have been talking about a number of different subjects that I think the common thread that runs through them is that there are essentially two religions in this world. There is the religion of God, and there is the religion that man uses to distract himself from God. The second religion comes in a host of different forms, and yet it is one that has a very old history and keeps coming back to the same basic thoughts. I found a quote this week that I thought gave great description of this contrast. Whitaker Chambers was a communist who came forward back in the 1940s and repudiated communism, and he wrote a book talking about his conversion from being a homosexual uh, communist to being a Christian. And in the beginning of the book he has a letter to his children and he explains there something that I think would be very helpful for us in terms of understanding this contrast between the real religion of God and the counterfeits of man. He says, communists are bound together by no secret oath. The tie that binds them across the frontiers of nations, across the barriers of language, and differences of class and education, in defiance of religion, morality, truth, law, honor, the weakness of the body, and the irre uh, irresolutions of the mind, even unto death, is a simple conviction. It is necessary to change the world. It is not new. It is, in fact, man's second oldest faith. Its promise was whispered in the first days of creation under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Ye shall be as gods. It is the great alternative faith of mankind. Like all great faiths, its force derives from a single vision. Other ages have had great visions. They have always been different versions of the same vision. The vision of God and man's relationship to God. The communist vision is the vision of man without God. It is the vision of man's mind displacing God as the creative intelligence of the world. It is the vision of man's liberated mind by the sole force of its rational intelligence, redirecting man's destiny and reorganizing man's life and the world. Now communism is just one example of these religions. Communism technically didn't believe in a God, and yet they believed that there was the inexorable destiny that communism must win. They had a message of salvation, they had a creation myth, they had their martyrs, they had all the trappings of a religion, and they had the fervor of religion. Like Buddhism, it was technically atheistic, and yet it was simply, I believe, that their God was not personal in a strict sense of that. Now, last week we received a phone call of someone who was very upset that I was talking about the duty of parents to educate their children according to the scriptures and not handing them over to people who are self-avowed enemies of the Christian faith. He said, basically, I should shut up and preach the gospel, talk about Jesus. So much of what calls itself Christianity today is just a different form of the same religion as communism. 
where you may have a God, and he may even be personal, but ultimately the deciding force in all of history is man. It is man who wills. That comes in a host of different forms, from free agency and Mormonism, where the idea of being as God is embraced, where the fall was seen as a fall upward, where it establishes free agency to prove your worthiness because you're working hand in hand with God. It ranges from that to much of what calls itself even evangelical Christianity today. In the Protestant Reformation, all the Protestant reformers may have differed on a variety of things, but they stood together on one basic message, that it is God alone who saves. It is not us working with God. It's not us meriting the merit of Christ. It's not even us generating our own faith. It is God from beginning to end. It is all of grace. What makes one person to differ from another is not our will, but God. The, the Roman Catholic Church in the medieval period repudiated the historic faith of the church. They embraced a synergistic idea that we have to work together with God in order to be saved. How are you saved according to Roman Catholicism? You are baptized. Traditional Roman Catholic belief, you are born again by baptism. After you are baptized, then you go through the various sacraments of the church. Uh, it is by the working of the work. It is by the uh, ascribing of merits of the saints and all these other things brought together, suffering and purgatory, all these various things are what make you ultimately right with God. Christ is in the picture, but Christ is only helping good people save themselves. It's the same, same basic message as the LDS Church, which says that uh, it is only after all we can do that grace saves. First Nephi 25, uh, was it 25, 23, uh, Moroni 10:32. after you deny yourself of all ungodliness and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then is His grace sufficient for you. It is the synergism because all that God does in this vision is God helps, but God doesn't make the final choice. The final choice lays in man because it is man's will, not God's, that shapes the future. Now that may seem unfair to lump all these things together with communism and everything else, but the Protestant reformers, they agreed on this. Martin Luther wrote one of the most powerful arguments against the Roman Catholic Church in this regard. The uh, Catholic apologist Erasmus wrote a book called On the Freedom of the Will. And Luther responded with a book called On the Bondage of the Will. And he thanked Erasmus. He said, you know, you've gotten beyond all the peripheral issues, the masses, the indulgences, the saints, all these other trappings. And you've gotten to the focus of the issue between us. And that focus is this. Are we saved because we have done something different from everyone else of our own power? Why do I believe and someone else doesn't? Does the answer lay in me or does it lay in God? The Protestant reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Hugh Latimer, Cranmer, you go down the list, Knox, Beza, they all agreed the reason that I believe and someone smarter and stronger and better than me doesn't believe is not because I've done something better. It's because God had mercy on me. The Bible's very clear. God is the one whose will shapes the future. It is God who determines who believes and who doesn't. 
It's not as if people want to believe and God doesn't let them. The reality is that we are described as dead in our sins and trespasses, and the only reason anyone believes is that God has mercy. He quickens them in the language of the old King James. He makes them alive who were dead in their trespasses and sins. The religions of man hate this idea, and all of them are different forms of the same thing. Ye shall be as gods. You are the one whose will matters. You are the one who will be in the place of God. It is on you that the future depends. Your will, your decisions. And if you come to Christ, it is because you did it. The Bible empties every one of us of any boasting. It says the only reason that any of us believe is because God had mercy on us. We're going to be talking about the different forms of this, ranging from uh, Mormonism, Roman Catholicism, and even, unfortunately, much of what calls itself evangelicalism, because we have forgotten what the whole Protestant Reformation was about. In the Protestant Reformation, they went back to the Bible. They claimed sola scriptura. Scripture alone is our infallible rule of faith and practice. And when they read the scriptures, they found it wasn't God helping good people save themselves. It was God raising the spiritually dead to life, taking those who would run for the shadows. Remember what John says, this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. And they would not come to the light. By nature, every one of us would run from God and never come to Him. We do not have the, we are not born with the ears to hear and the eyes to see. We are insensible to the things of God. The natural man can't understand the things of God because we're dead. We need to be made alive. We don't simply need a plan of salvation that involves a whole host of works like the Roman Catholic Church or a work where somehow or another faith is something that we come up with on our own. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say that faith is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Philippians 1, 29, it has not only been given to you believe, uh, to believe, but also to suffer for his sake. It has been given to believe. It is God who makes the difference. We're going to look at that tonight, but I want to go ahead and open up the phone lines. Are we holding to the religion of the Bible which says that apart from the grace of God, none of us would believe? Where it's monergistic, where it's God alone who decides that any would believe? Or is it somehow synergism where God helps good people save themselves? Where God helps people that they can somehow muster up some will on their own and then he, he helps them the rest of the way. Are we sick in sin or are we dead in sin? That's the issue this evening. The phone number here, 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. There I think you have this very clear explanation that the reason that anyone believes is not because somehow they are smarter or stronger, but because God has had mercy. It says in Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the Spirit now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, 
and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The point that Paul is making here is that we were just like everyone else. We were children of wrath, just like all the rest of the world around us. Why do we differ? Why do we believe? God had mercy. God is not unjust, giving everyone else what they deserve, but we who were fit only for hell, who not only uh, would not believe, but could not believe, He had mercy on us and He made us alive. We were dead, but now we're alive. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29, it says there, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. It is not by works that we have done, even believing. The reason that we believe is that God has made us alive. The religion of the Bible isn't one of God helping good people save themselves. It's not synergism. It says that God alone is God. It says that it is His will that is supreme. God is not off wringing His hands wondering what man is going to do or dependent on, on man's belief in Him to somehow do something. It is God who raises us up. It is God who is working in us both to will and to do His good pleasure. A friend of mine, she left the Mormon church years ago, uh, went into Wicca and then was in a uh, broad evangelical church that no longer believed what the Protestant reformers all believed. She came to one of our debates and she was astounded because she heard what she still believed being articulated by the LDS representative, the former uh, institute director up at the University of Utah. What he put forward was synergism. It was God dependent on the free agency of man. Even though she had left Mormonism 20 years earlier, she was frustrated to find out that to a great extent she was still believing the same thing she thought she had repudiated. And when she heard the other side articulated from the Bible, she realized God is God and we're not. That none of us are compelled by God to do evil. But by nature, that's all that we would do unless God changed our hearts. And God, unless on the unbelievers, He restrained that sin in us. But all glory belongs to Him. God has chosen, not the wise, the ones who are smart enough to figure it out, not even in some counterintuitive wisdom, but the foolish, not the strong, those who persevere and, and deal with their sins and do these things. It's the weak. Why has He chosen the weak and the foolish things of this world that no flesh should glory in His presence? If you're a Christian, why do you believe? 
Do you think that you're smarter than other people, that you're stronger than other people? Do you think that somehow you've mustered up the faith? Then you're, you're boasting in what you've done. What John Newton understood, the author of Amazing Grace, Charles Spurgeon, uh, Jonathan Edwards, you go down the list, what historic Protestant belief clearly understood is, except for the grace of God, any Christian would uh, make the worst sinner look good. That it is all of God. It is God from beginning to end. We're going to go to our first call. We have with us Ross from Salt Lake. Ross, good to have you with us. Thank you. You're on the air. Yes, I wanted to ask a question. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. I'll try to answer the question, even though it's not really on the subject, but um, in, a, in a way it is. The idea that somehow God is in control of everything, that He is God, is contrary to what people like to think. They like a God that they can fit in a box, that they can manage and control. Well, the doctrine of the Trinity shows that God is beyond our comprehension. Uh, as someone who realizes just how small my comprehension is, I'm glad that God doesn't uh, get completely defined by my understanding. The Bible says that there is one God. The Shema in Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Over and over in Scripture, we are told that there is one God. Isaiah uh, 43.10 says that um, before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. The, um, you go through 42, 43, 44, and 45, numerous times uh, we're told that there's only one God. He doesn't know of any other gods. That there is no other Savior. He is the only God. Uh, you come, Jesus affirms this, uh, quoting from uh, the Shema in Deuteronomy 6. So Old Testament, New Testament, there's one God. Uh, 1 Corinthians, what is it, chapter 10? Uh, this is the one that's often abused by LDS missionaries, or at least used to be. Uh, there are Lord's many and God's many, but to us there's one. The context there is idolatry. There's only one God. So that point is made over and over in Scripture. But then you come to the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John starts off, in the beginning was the Word. In Arche Ainho Agos, in the Greek. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So there is a distinction between the Word and God, and the Word was God. So there's an identity. And we're told in uh, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word is Jesus. That, that's very clear. So the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, and then it says, just uh, verse 18, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Once again, there's a distinction. I have heard so many LDS say, the Bible contradicts itself, because it says no man has seen God, and yet Moses saw God. What they don't understand is the, very, the two passages to which they refer where it says that we haven't seen God. 
are in the very same chapters where it's talking about seeing God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh, and we beheld His glory. The glory is in the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We've seen God. We've seen the Son. And yet, we've not seen the Father, but the Son reveals Him. Same thing back in uh, Exodus 34, I believe it is, 33, 34, where we're told that Moses spoke to God face to face as to a friend. The terminology there is of familiarity. Yet, it's only a few verses later. It's not somewhere else off in the Bible. That there's a context to it that says that God says, you can't see my face. Uh, Moses longs to see God's glory. Mormons say, well, obviously the Bible contradicts itself. No. Words in the Bible are like words elsewhere. They have a range of meanings. We have to look at context. We don't assume that if it doesn't fit our particular theology that it must contradict itself. No. We've seen God. Uh, Isaiah 6. Isaiah has this vision of God on his throne. Well, then in John, we're told, in John's gospel, we're told that was Jesus that he saw. We've seen God, and yet it's Jesus who reveals the Father. That's the one that says that um, no man has seen God at any time. So, in terms of the Trinity, we see that the Father is God and the Son is God. In Matthew chapter 3, we see the baptism of Jesus. We see that there is clear distinction. Jesus is baptized. The heavens are open. The Holy Spirit descends. Voice comes from heaven. Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. There is distinction between Father and Son and Spirit. And yet, all three are described as God. It's not one God acting as Father, acting as Son, acting as Spirit. There is distinction, and yet there's one God. How does that all fit together? I don't know. But it's clearly stated in the Bible. I'm not taking things out of context. Jesus himself says these things. Uh, Paul, in Philippians 2, says that uh, Jesus, being very nature God, let's see, Philippians chapter 2, he says, um, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took on himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Um, Philippians. I'm sorry, that was Philippians. Colossians. Uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 9, For in him, speaking of Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. How do you make sense of all these things? When we're told over and over, the Father's God, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit's God, and yet we're told the Father's not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit's not the Father, and yet there's only one God and they're all God. We accept it. Does that fit with our experiences? You take someone who's been living in Papua New Guinea and you can take them to New York and there's a whole lot of things that are beyond their comprehension because they, it's outside their whole realm of experience. The God who created us created galaxies with a word. We're, on a, we're, we're, we're creatures of dust and ashes living on a speck of dust in this creation. And somehow or another we're supposed to fit God into our view? That's just as ridiculous as thinking that His will is dependent on my will. It's just as foolish as saying, ye shall be as gods. When creatures of dust and ashes 
are presuming that to themselves. We're going to go to our next call. We have Bryce from Provo. Bryce, good to have you with us. Yeah, hi, Pastor Wallace. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to uh, just let you know um, I try to watch the show every week, and I just wanted to let you know that I found this show and the last show just extremely informative, and uh, I just really appreciate what it is that you're doing. And uh, Thank you. And uh, I just wanted to thank you personally. Thank you so much. That's, that's, that's a great encouragement. Is this the same Bryce I knew years ago? Yeah. Wonderful. Um, give me a call anytime. I'd love to get together with you. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, we're going to go next to Janice in Kearns. Janice, good to have you with us. Hello? Hello, Janice? Um, you would like to make... Whoops, mashed the wrong button. Sorry about that, Janice. Oh, hi. Hey, hey, I'm sorry. I hey, mashed the wrong button. I just button. wanted to tell you that I am just really enjoying tonight's program. Can you hear me okay? Wonderful. Yeah, we, okay. we've had some technical problems, but they seem to have worked them all out now, so... Oh, very good. Yeah, it's a little bit delayed, and so it's different to watch it on the screen, and I understand why people get so confused. Yeah, we tell, um, we tell them to turn it down, but... Most people don't. <laughs> I, yes, exactly. But I just, you know, I love that section of Scripture, Ephesians 2, 1 through 9. I, actually, I would go into 10. I think it's actually the complete explanation of the gospel in just those 10, 10 verses. And if, yeah, it, I, if you really think about it, it it'll change your life. Truly. Uh, truly, right because... About it, there only being two religions in the world, Christianity and the religion of self. It's, well, yeah, the religion of Satan, that ye shall be as gods. That somehow or another, you can manipulate God. That you can, you can manage God in some way. And that's, that's, that's insane. But, uh, yeah, verse 10, I, I should have included that. It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So, hey, much appreciate the, the call and the encouragement. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Um, what does it mean to be the workmanship of God? So many people have this idea that salvation is that I get presented with an offer. And if I will give mental assent to the idea Jesus died for me, he's going to save me. James chapter 2 deals with that kind of faith. He says, you believe there's one God? You do well. Even the belief, even demons believe and tremble. The problem that so many people seem to have is the idea that real faith Real belief is not something that we can generate ourselves. It is, it is the new birth that Jesus spoke of to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You must be born again. That was the message of the Reformation. That was the message of the Great Awakening. That was the message of Charles Spurgeon. That was the message of Jonathan Edwards. John Newton, Augustus Toplady. You go through the history of the church. This is the overwhelming chorus of voices, you must be born again. Not that you somehow cause yourself to be born again, but God is the one who has to raise you to life. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, but God is the one who makes us alive. Why does he, why does he make any alive? Because he's merciful. Why doesn't he make all alive? He chooses otherwise. He gives justice to some. This idea of God as the one who's ultimately in control, that it's His mercy that makes the difference, is not something people like. Let's look at Romans chapter 9 for a moment. There we have a contrast between the religion of man, which says that, you know, I'll deal with God on my terms. 
and a religion that says, it's God who has to do all these things. It's God who has to give me faith. It's God who has to make me alive. God is not manipulable. I can't pit my will versus His. Um, the Apostle Paul ends chapter 8 of Romans with this wonderful declaration that, that neither height nor depth nor any other created thing shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Over and over he, he makes the point that there is no power that can pull us from Christ. It's God who justifies. If the, we have this wonderful assurance in Christ, why is it that most Jews didn't believe? How is it that after 2,000 years of dealing with the physical descendants of Abraham, so few respond? Well, Paul deals with that in Romans 9. He says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish my, uh, myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. I apologize, I thought we had a graphic on this. Who are Israelites, this is Romans 9, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever, amen. So he's, he's expressing his compassion for his kinsmen according to the flesh, those who are Israelites. But he says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Just because they are of the physical seed of Abraham doesn't mean that they are the children of promise. He says, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac thy seed shall be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. You remember Sarah thought she could help God, told Abraham, here, have, have a child by my handmaid. And he has Ishmael. God comes and says, he's going to give him a son by Sarah. And Abraham's response is, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. He says, no, but Sarah's going to have a son. And he makes very clear that it's through Isaac. He's going to bless Ishmael, but he's not going to be, he's not going to have his covenant people through him. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul contrasts the unbelieving Jews with Christians, and he says that they correspond to Hagar and to, to Mount Sinai, that the Jerusalem that is below is in bondage with, it, with her children, but we are of the Jerusalem that is above, that is free. He's telling this to Gentiles. We are the children of Abraham who have faith. But the point he's making here is, just because they're the physical seed doesn't mean that they're, that they're um, heirs of the promise. He says, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, so there's one father. Even though it's one mother, there's no question about who the father was. It wasn't two different fathers, it's one father. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Before either had done any good or evil, God's not simply looking forward to what good or evil they'll do, but that the purpose of God according to his election his decision, he takes two boys who are both bad. Esau sells his birthright. Esau marries the Canaanite woman. Esau's not all that great, but Esau's actually somewhat more sympathetic than Jacob. Jacob's the one 
who dresses up to deceive his father. He doesn't trust God. He lies to his father. Uh, he dishonors him. He blasphemes the Lord's name, calling on him as a witness in all this. So there's three of the commandments immediately right there. Uh, he tells his mother he's going to be gone for a little while, and he's gone for 21 years, though it seemed only a little while. Uh, he, he's not trusting God over and over. We see his faithlessness. He, he like, um, like Abraham and Isaac before him. He's not a good guy, but God had mercy on him. He loved him in spite of his sin. And Esau, Esau got what he deserved. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Paul anticipates, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. And then he goes on to show the example of Pharaoh. He says, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. He's talking about hardening Pharaoh's heart. He says, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt, then, uh, thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault for who has resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why, have you made, why hast, hast thou made me thus? Hath not the power, potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. God has mercy on whom he'll have mercy. He doesn't owe any of us anything but hell. As a just God, he owes all of us that. The good news is he sent his son to take our place. But we wouldn't even believe on him uh, under those circumstances, except he has mercy and makes us alive. That's why we differ. We're going to go to the next phone call. We have Bob from South Jordan. Bob, good to have you with us. Hi, thank you. Um, Sorry for so the long delay. I have there. just an honest, I'm Mormon, so, but mm -hmm. I have an honest question and in, in interpretation. Sure. That, uh, you know, I really do actually want to kind of maybe see how you guys believe about this. Okay. Um, when when the Bible teaches in numerous places that it's, you know, our obedience is required for salvation, uh, and I'm thinking specifically of Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, um, Abraham being blessed in, in uh, Genesis 22, 18, places like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in 1 Timothy, uh, was it uh, 2, 4, where it says, you know, it's the will of God that all men should be saved. So how do you harmonize the will of God is to save all people, and the Bible teaching that our obedience is required with just a, a grace-only solution. Okay. Um, hold, hold the line, because I, you, you spit out a lot of things there, and I'm trying to digest them as, as we're going here. Okay. In terms of Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, I'll read the passage here. Though he were a son, yet he learned, uh, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So, do we have to obey? Yes. I read Ephesians 2.10 earlier. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. This is, this is the great frustration uh, for so much of what uh, LDS here is coming from a cheap grace perspective these days, which is not historic um, understanding of the Bible. It's not what the Bible teaches. The idea that somehow you can walk an aisle, pray a prayer, and go live like a pagan and, and be a carnal Christian and be saved 
uh, or you can accessorize your salvation by making Jesus Lord like you made him Savior. Um, that's not biblical at all. Uh, the reality is this. We are called to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. We're also told that, that, that when we believe, it's because it's a gift of God, that we've been made alive. So there is an outward call, but we're also given the perspective from heaven that it's God who, is, who has given us the ears to hear and the eyes to see. Because it is a new birth, the same Holy Spirit that, that gives us faith indwells us and transforms us. Romans 8 uh, makes very clear uh, for whom he foreknew. And it's not foreknowledge of events, it's people he foreknew. He, he loved them. I, I won't get into the etymology because we're running short on time. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. Salvation is a new birth. It is, uh, it's not of works, Ephesians 2, 9. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But the very next verse, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. It is not that faith plus works equals salvation. It is that faith that comes from regeneration, from the Holy Spirit giving us faith, Philippians 1.29, Ephesians 2.8. It is faith brings justification and repentance. The whole, same Holy Spirit who gives us faith gives us repentance, gives us works that flow from that. There, there are the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, adultery, sexual uh, immorality, all, theft, all these other things, murder. And those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's contrasted not by the works that somehow we do in the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit in us. And um, what was the passage that you were referring to? Uh, was it 1 Timothy? Oh, uh, yeah, 1 Timothy 2.4. 2, for uh, for first, the will of God that, uh, that all men should be saved. Okay, 1 Timothy 2.4. Go back to verse 1 for context. Mm -hmm. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So what's the context here? The context is prayer. Um, and they're asking for prayer for all men. What's the temptation in this time period? The ne very next epistle, Paul's going to be in a Roman prison about to be killed. He knows that, his, he knows that, his, that he's about to die at the hands of the Romans. Um, Temptation is going to be for Christians to be very hateful to their rulers because from 64 A.D. forward until the conversion of Constantine, Rome is at war with Christianity. Remember, Nero blames Christians for the burning of Rome. So I exhort, therefore, that first of all, prayers, uh, first uh, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. The context there is on prayer. The context, I believe, is fairly clear. It's all kinds of men. It's not uh, you don't revel in the fact that, hey, we're the weak and the foolish and all those other people, God's just not going to save any of them. You pray for all men. One of the things you have to take in the Bible is let Scripture interpret Scripture. So many LDS uh, pit Scripture against Scripture. They see James 2 and Ephesians 2 and they say, well, they contradict, so we have to pick one, we're going to pick James. But but within um, w within First Timothy there, the mm -hmm. the Greek word that he uses is pos uh, is all, and he uses it. And I don't I've used to count it, but I, he uses it numerous times. Yes. And and in every instance, 
all means all. I mean, to, to say that this means like I don't, a I few don't out of <laughs> all different brands of types of humans, uh, really, I think, I mean, you just have to read a couple more verses to see that that wouldn't really fit the context of that verse. So if we're okay. going to have the Bible interpret the Bible, it seems like, you know, you would at the very least have the chapter interpret the chapter, right? Well, tell me something. Uh, according to your view, does God, uh, does God desire that all, that every man be saved? Yes. And yet God fails. Yes, God fails because He grants us free will. So what? So Satan was right. We are as God. We, we, we can determine the future. Well, in, in Genesis 3.22, God confirms that Satan was right. Right? No. He says specifically, he says, man man is become as one of us. Knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil. Well, that's all that Satan said would happen, is, is you will become as the gods, knowing good and evil. So exactly what Satan said, God confirms happened. And is that viewed as a good thing or a bad thing in Genesis 3? Um, it's, it's more of a neutral thing. It's, it's, that's why they're, they're ejected from the garden. Um, how about the curse that they brought upon themselves? How about death? It's not a neutral thing. They hid... They well, hid, they except hid, that they in hid. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, that's specifically why Jesus is said to have become perfected is because of the things which he experienced. He was already God. The, you have to look at the term uh, in the context there. So, so I mean, what, he's, he's, I guess, so, he Pastor, fulfilled, what, what he, he fulfilled does all the law. author of Hebrews mean by saying that he, he became, you know, but he became perfected by the things which he learned? What, 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 did, what did God learn that he couldn't have learned before he was born as a man. The in in the five minutes left, I don't have time to begin to I'm adequately sorry, yeah. deal with. I mean, we've jumped all over the place here. Uh, I'm happy to answer your question off the air if you like. But what what do you make of Romans nine? What do you make of Ephesians two? You do you accept them? And if so, how do you interpret them? Uh, can you give us that and? 30 seconds to a minute. Sure, the 30-second soliloquy. Yeah, because <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, but uh, you, in, in Romans 9, uh, the, for, the, the predestination or foreordination which takes place, I believe, is God selecting all of us. I mean, we're here for a purpose, and He, he knows who's going to be saved, but through the process of living here, um, each of those things that Paul itemizes well, in Romans 9... Go ahead. Just a moment. Uh, in terms of the context here, he's telling why most of Israel doesn't believe that they have not been chosen because God has not had mercy on them. That's the reason, I mean, that's the whole context here. How, does, how is it he's chosen everybody and yet it's clear he hasn't chosen most of Israel because they don't believe? Well, the title Israel is is a group of people, right? I mean, that's Paul's point: is not all Israel is Israel, and and I mean the the whole issue about the clay and things like that. As we read back in Ezekiel and Isaiah, we realize that this is the context of God selecting an entire nation as the vehicle for salvation uh, to come to the world, and and so when he says not all Israel is Israel, he's not saying that I don't want individuals specific individuals saved, he's saying that the way for people to be saved is through this nation of Israel, this, 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 these descendants of Abraham, and that, that Israel was selected and foreordained, but not all individuals within there are going to be saved, because that's the nature of choice. But it says it's not of him who willeth, but of God who shows mercy. I, 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 and I would agree with that. I don't believe it's possible for a human being, no matter how good you are, to save yourself. I don't think that's possible. But I don't think it's possible for us to, 
to um, think that we can, uh, um, that, that God can force any person to heaven. I don't think okay. that's possible either. I think, not, I think it's, it's a, not there is a work required of us, a good deeds, obedience, that kind of thing. Uh, one quick question, because we're almost out of time. Do you believe that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? Yes, I, I do. I think, well, uh, Joseph Smith the scripture says he does, but it also says that, that Pharaoh hardened his heart. That the, As a result of the, the things which were plaguing Pharaoh, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and God, in effect, did that. It's like uh, saying, oh, you make me so mad. I, I have one minute you to close You don't make me up. so mad. I get mad because of you. I have one minute to wrap up before the end. Okay, the I'm sorry, Pastor. Thank, Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. What we need to understand here is it's not a matter of God forcing people to be good or to be bad. It is God taking out that heart of stone as described in Ezekiel and giving us a heart of flesh. It is God raising us from spiritual death to spiritual life. It is giving us the ears to hear and the eyes to see. It is God having mercy on people who don't deserve anything but judgment. Uh, when He gives us that heart, we free, before He gives us that, we freely choose to run away. He's not making us. That's who we are. Our, our will is following our nature. We are freely willing to do what's wrong. Conversely, when He gives us that new heart, when He gives us the Holy Spirit, we, we turn to Him. So, um, anyway, Joseph Smith said that um, Pharaoh didn't, uh, God did not harden Pharaoh's heart, that only Pharaoh hardened his heart. He changed the translation in both places. The fall was not a good thing or a neutral thing. It was a tragedy. Thankfully, it was undone in Christ. And it is all of mercy. It is all of grace. And yet, we are new creatures, and we live accordingly. That's all we have time to deal with this evening. Uh, I'd like to invite you to worship with us Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South. That's Main Street Magna. We have a sister congregation, Berean Presbyterian Church, meets in Ogden at 9 a.m. at 3350 Harrison Boulevard. And uh, we are doing uh, work down in Utah County and elsewhere. If you would like more information, you can give us a call at 801-969-7948. Or you can go to our website, website www.christpress.net. Till next time, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings. Please read your Bible. Until then, good night.